Hey, Tom here. Uh, so, look, today we're going to watch uh, Ken McElroy's Eight Keys to Buying Property. I'll play it in fast speed, and I'll react to it and comment on it. Uh, Ken's got a little different experience in real estate than I do, uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing what he's got. Hi, I'm Tom McKay. I've been investing in real estate, commercial properties, industrial properties, houses, apartments, offices, subdivisions. I also have a mentorship course to help people create their own fortunes the same way. My first class, I had immediate results. Ron made over $200,000 and has purchased 22 properties. Eric has purchased a trailer park and 34 acres of land. Liam has already flipped a few properties and made over $100,000 on his first deal. All right, so this is Ken's uh, eight keys to buying property. And uh, we'll go ahead and start this. And I'm going to go ahead and put this up a little bit faster speed. Hey, guys, it's Ken. So as you guys know that Ross and I buy a lot of land for apartments. We buy a lot of land for commercial development, doing self-storage, office buildings, apartments, even residential. So there's a lot of things that you need to know before you actually buy land. I see a lot of people buying land online without looking at it. So I'm going to go over eight things that I think would be very important for you to ask or think about before you actually pull the trigger and actually buy the property. So the first thing is terrain. So obviously to start purchasing land, it's not like purchasing a home off of Zillow. You need to physically look at the land so that you can see what it is that the land can be used for. Seeing the land in person is crucial because seeing a piece of land online will not tell you about the soil, the surrounding area, the topo, the terrain, or anything like that. It's really hard to see those things from an aerial standpoint, and usually most land is looked at from the top. Whatever you are looking to use the land for, you will have different criteria and different needs. So let me just tell you a couple things about terrain. If you buy a piece of land that has a big slope, you have to do what's called retaining walls all through the property. Okay, you know, I've bought a lot of land, and I bought some of it sight unseen. It's not the way I like to do it. I agree with Ken. Uh, you definitely do want to see what you got for the most part. Uh, I can tell you something interesting happened to me one time where I bought a property. It was a 10-acre piece, perfect square. Never saw it, bought it cheap, sold it pretty quick and made some money on it. Uh, and then the person I sold it to had sold it to somebody else. I, I got a call like two years later and uh, some Japanese folks, and they said that the land, uh, they, and they paid, I mean, I sold it for like, I don't know, 60 grand or something like that. I can't even remember. Well, they had paid like 240000 for it. They got really taken advantage of it. And it wasn't, <laughs> the land was perfect. It wasn't worth anything out there. It was way out in the desert. Anyways, so they called me, and the first thing I did is I look at my contract because I want to make sure that I disclosed if there was any issues. And I wrote, properties being sold as is. Uh, buyer has fully inspected the property and accepts the property in its condition. If you buy a piece of land that has a big slope, you have to do what's called retaining walls all through the property. And so those retaining walls can be 200000 500000 even a million dollars, depending on what it is to get the land buildable, to get it flat, because proper, because buildings have to be flat on a piece of land. So you can buy land super cheap with a big terrain, but it, it's going to be very costly to be able to build everything flat on it. So be very careful about the terrain. Hey guys. Yeah, so he's right about that. You know, and I've actually bought a lot of hillside properties and sold them in uh, Lake Is Elizabeth uh, in California. Uh, I went through probably 40, 50 lots there. And, uh, but, you know, they are buildable. It just depends on how much slope. And, you know, that would be an extreme, the foundations he was describing. But, you know, it's real. Let's keep listening. Hey, guys, before I go any further, please hit the like button if you guys enjoy this. Floods are common. Oh, yeah. Hit the like button here, too, which. <laughs> common and can be very expensive. And oftentimes, you do not want land that are in flood zones. So there's different kinds of flood zones. And so you have to know exactly what kind of flood zone it is. Okay, I'm going to say something about that because there's different flood zones. Maybe he's going to get into it. But if you get in like an 100-year flood zone, you can build in that. And I made several million dollars, uh, uh, or at least eh, about two and a half million dollars on a piece of land that it was exactly that. Uh, in fact, I could show it to you. Basically, I had six, 50 acres, 52 acres, and it had a creek running through it. And it was like a seasonal creek. It seemed like it was wet all the time because I had a spring in it too, so a little bit of water would always be running through this thing. But all I had to do was improve it a little bit. And uh, FEMA knew about it, and I spent 20000 to do a flood study uh, on it, and I had to improve the ditch. So I got a bulldozer, and we just ran it through and cut it clean and made the edges a little wider and cleaner. And, I mean, this is like, I mean, this is like thousands of feet long. But I spent maybe twenty twenty five thousand bucks, 25000 And now the whole thing was buildable you could build right up and it was a, a nice feature actually it was a nice feature to have that little creek through it uh here let me show you this is a property i bought because i don't want you to be discouraged i mean this is a creek right here this is a creek it's going here runs all the way down it actually runs the other way it runs this way it goes under like under the street over here 
and then it runs here, runs here. My kids, my boys actually caught their first fish right here. <laughs> There's a spring right here. So even when this was a little bit dry, there was always a big puddle of water here. But look, folks, I bought this property for $200,000, and I sold it for $2.8 million. So I made a lot of money on this. And it was worth more than that the day I bought it, of course. And it wasn't all about, I did improve this, and that made more of this property usable. So don't be afraid of all flood zone property. You know, like I always tell you, uh, you know, there is no bad property. There's just bad deals. You know, don't pay too much for a property because there's value in, in everything. Even though you may not see it, you may not want it. Somebody else does. So let's keep watching. Well, sometimes you can insure around it. Sometimes you won't even be able to build on it. Flood zones are determined by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Act. You can go online and check the different designations around flood zones. It basically says that those lands have a high risk of flooding. And the insurance company is going to have a problem with that. And your property can have a problem with that. Oftentimes, realtors do not know that there's flood zones on property. So you really need to make sure before you buy something that it doesn't have a flood zone. So let me tell you a little story about flood zones. So I have a friend that bought 15 acres with an old resort that he wanted to renovate and reopen. And it was 15 acres along this beautiful little creek called Oak Creek, which runs right through Sedona, Arizona. So he bought the land and he started to renovate the property. And he started to fix all the units that needed to be fixed and he wanted to open. And then what happened was the creek rose and flooded almost half of his property. What he forgot to check was that half the property was in a flood zone and therefore not buildable. So of the 15 acres, he only had a little over seven that he could actually do anything on. So be very careful because oftentimes you can buy a big piece of land and not be able to use it all. So if you guys like this, be so sure to hit the link below and grab the show notes and we're gonna have those available for you. The third thing is around utilities. So obviously a big piece of vacant land out in the middle of the forest does not have utilities to it. So it can be very expensive getting power, water, cable, all of those things. And it has to come from somewhere. So it, it might have to come from a mile. It might have to come Yeah, here's something about forest property also. It's expensive to clear, okay, <laughs> because that tree, those trees grow like grass. You can have a, you know, like a 100-foot tree every three feet. It's something you got to factor in. Clear, clearing a place and pulling those root balls out uh, is a big endeavor. So they come from 100 yards. It might be the contiguous property next to it. So bringing utilities to a piece of vacant land can be very, very, very expensive. So Ross and I have run into this before we buy apartment land. So oftentimes we'll buy land and then we have to run utilities through it. And sometimes it can be very costly and sometimes it can be from a long way away. So be very careful. And so oftentimes when you see master plans, when you drive into a subdivision, for example, you'll have a residential lot. Well, that master developer has already put all the utilities in there. So uh, you know what? This, this is relevant to uh, back to this property here. Uh, this property here, one of the reasons it was so valuable is they'd already put a 24-inch sewer main. So a lot of times whenever you see a creek, a creek is like what? The lowest, it's like the lowest part of the property. Whenever you find a creek, it's the lowest, it's the lowest spot of all the area because that's where all the water runs and it forms the creek and that runs whatever way it runs and it creates that channel. Well, so creeks are a natural place, the most logical place to put a sewer in. So a lot of times people don't realize this. You'll see beautiful creeks, people fishing and all this other stuff, there's a sewer underneath it. They'll, what they'll do is they'll dig down, you know, another 10 feet or, or whatever below the creek. And then that's where they put in their big sewer main. And they'll run that through. And because it's the lowest point of all the terrain, uh, just like, uh, you know, because when you build houses and stuff, all that stuff has to, you know, <laughs> gravity flow to the lowest point. And so it's going to want to head to that creek if it was on the surface. Same thing. You go underground five feet, 10 feet. Your pipes from your houses lead to the mains. Everything goes down. There's value there. Like I said, this had a 24-inch sewer main. And, you know, and I'll tell you what this was. This was a failed trailer park. They put in, uh, they would put in uh, 12 trailers right here, right above my head here, right here. Uh, they would put in 12 trailers, and each one had like half an acre. And <laughs> they put it in before the sewer was in. And so each trailer had its own septic field. And anyways, it was a family thing that went, bust and uh you know i bought a long time ago but it just something to added information i don't think he's going to talk about this but yeah sewer sewers follow those creeks it's the logical place to put them and it's a it's an asset so you just have to put the house on it and then hook everything up so the fourth thing is to look at what's actually physically on the property is it cleared does it have trees does it have a rock outcropping there's all kinds of regulations around trees Trees are protected in many, oh, many, yeah. many Horrible. areas. In one area, Flagstaff, Arizona, where we were going to build, we had a 15-acre property that we thought we were going to get 200 units on, and the city has an ordinance that actually protects the trees. They protect the tree groupings. And we had to get an aerial canopy cover to be able to group the trees around, and so the city was very specific on which trees we could take out and which trees we had to keep. 
And so what it did is it reduced the density or the number of units that we could actually get on that property. So when we thought we were going to get over 200 units, it ended up being closer to 100. And therefore, 100 units on 15 acres didn't make sense to buy the land. Additionally, tree land is expensive to clear, and there are a lot of regulations that make clearing expensive and very, very difficult. So when you're comparing purchase prices and you're looking at land, make sure that you're comparing tree land with tree land and clear land with clear land and look at all the regulations that the city might have. You want to make sure that you understand the costs and the time frame of all those things before you buy it. Because you, if you don't have the city approvals and you buy the land, you might find that you might not be able to build exactly what it is that you thought you could when you originally purchased it. Yeah, you got to do your due diligence and check that stuff out. He's 100% right on that. Uh, and what he's described basically is a tree survey. This I can tell you right now, if you got a tree and you want to get rid of it, you better get rid of it. Because if you go down and talk to the city about it, they're going to want to come out and do a tree survey. And if you've ever seen, you'll see trees around and they got tags you see like a little metal tag. It'll be kind of odd. Maybe you don't even notice them, but they're there. And once they do that, they've mapped all the trees on your lot. So sometimes you can come in to buy a property, like he was talking about, coming in to buy that property. Well, they probably already mapped that thing, and they, and they know that all those trees are there. Uh, they can see them anyways from a satellite and that sort of thing. But trees do die and get lightning damage, although they can tell if there's been lightning. They, they actually have markers for wherever there's a lightning strike uh, because some people will say, ah, that tree died of lightning. They'll say, we don't show a lightning strike there. There's other kinds of things that kill trees, too. That very property, actually. I, two kids set a little fire out there somewhere and ended up setting my property on fire. When the fire department came in, they got heavy duty. They got bulldozer and stuff to make a path go through, and they destroyed uh, several you know, you know, century-old oaks that I had on that property. All right, hey, there's a part two to this video. If you want to see it, go to the next video. Uh, thanks for watching. Please uh, share and subscribe. Uh, this channel and uh, I appreciate it.